<clears throat> you want me to go ahead and start? No, so, uh, sir, I will, I, sorry, yeah. I will introduce you and then we can start. Okay. Just a couple of minutes. Yeah. We can start in a minute or two. I mean, it, it takes some time uh, uh, for people to uh, come together and, uh, uh, and and we have we have participants coming from uh, other countries as well. Uh, so not only North America, but uh, uh, from Malaysia and from Taiwan and other places. So I think we can give it a couple of minutes, but then maybe, you know, Asin can start in a slow pace uh, uh, introduction and all that. All right, uh, so then, what do, what yeah, do you think? Think. You want to do that or you want to wait a little bit? Yes, sir. Okay, we can start. Yes, and then it'll take just a couple of minutes. All right. Okay. So, yeah. so good evening, all. My name is Essen, and I'm the Surgical Neuro Oncology Fellow at the Khan University Hospital and member of Pakistan Society of Neuro Oncology PASMA. On behalf of PASNO, I welcome you all to this session. PASNO is organizing the Neuro-Oncology webinar series, and each session in this webinar series will be an hour long and held on alternate Saturdays. During the talk of our guest speaker, all attendees will be muted to enable the speaker to present without any interruption. Questions can be submitted in the chat box and will be answered once the presenter has finished their talk. Attendees can also raise their hands for questions. We will unmute them to speak. The session will be recorded and the link will be shared on the PASNO website. The speaker will take 30 minutes for topic presentation. And after that, there will be an open discussion between our esteemed speaker, panelists, and attendees. The topic of today's session is CNS tumor classification. What's new in WHO 2021? And today, we are truly honored to have Dr. Ahmed Gilad. Dr. Ahmed Gilani is an assistant professor of neuropathology at the University of Colorado, Denver, Anschutz Medical Campus. Dr. Gilani graduated from the Aga Khan University in 2004, after which he pursued a master's degree in biological science and completed a PhD in neurobiology from Columbia University. He trained at the Aiken School of Medicine at Mount Sinai for his residency in neuropathology and the University of Colorado, Denver for pediatric pathology. Dr. Gilani has numerous publications and has made a lasting impact on genetic analysis and targeting in tumors. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilani, for joining us today, sir. The floor is yours. Thanks very much for the kind in, in introduction. It's always a, uh, a pleasure to uh, come back to your alma mater, um, you know, even if it's remote. Um, so, um, I would talk about WHO classification of tumors. Um, and um, this talk would be primarily from the perspective of a pathologist. So I would like to learn from you how this new classification would impact your practice, or if, if you had felt any um, limitations in the 2016 um, classification that would be fulfilled by, by this updated one. So very briefly about the learning objectives, we would uh, go over briefly about the rationale behind um, classification schemes and go over the changes that have occurred in 2021 classification as a poll as um, compared to the 2016 one. And then um, briefly touch upon the um, molecular testing infrastructure that would be required to, um, to be up to date with the 2021 classification. Um, and I have no financial relationships to disclose. Um, so we, um, as you guys know, we currently classify brain tumors according to the um, WHO classification scheme. Um, currently we're having, um, end of this year, we would have the fifth um, update to this classification scheme. Uh, so the primary um, 
method that this classification uses is um, histologic classification. So, which is based upon uh, the um, resemblance of the tumor to non-neoplastic uh, cells present in the brain, which means that if, if the tumor resembles an oligo oligodendroglial cells, it would be called an oligodendroglioma. If it resembles astrocytic cells, it would be called um, astrocytic glioma and so on. Um, and then in the subsequent um, updates to the classification, starting primarily with the 2007 and then 2016 um, updates, we have started to include um, molecular features of the tumor into its um, um, naming and, uh, and um, um, classification as well. And that has been enabled largely by the, um, by the reduction in cost in sequencing technologies. And so that helps with the um, diagnos diagnosis, prognosis, and also the treatment of these tumors. So in the 2016 classification was the first one which came up with this idea of tiered or layered uh, diagnosis in which we give a histologic diagnosis, but we add on uh, the molecular information as well. And so 2016 was uh, the first time when we included um, molecular information as part of the diagnostic criteria of these tumors. And that trend will only continue with the 2021 classification. So um, classification, as, as you know, is, is a moving target. There are, um, and that's primarily because of, of new information that is coming in and our understanding of these tumors is increasing. So, so that le leads to these um, changes in classification. So um, primarily uh, new molecular techniques have enabled us to, uh, to see subgroups within larger groups of tumors. And so that has, uh, is uh, true for ependymoma and um, medullo blastoma subgroups, which have been recognized now in the new classification, as we will see. Um, we also have added or improved prognostic data about different tumor entities. Uh, the most notable example of that is the IDH mutant glioma. So that has led to changes in um, classification of, of that entity. And then um, um, as new um, entities are recognized and, um, and are increasingly being diagnosed by pathologists, we find out that, uh, that in some cases, we find uh, discordant ca cases which lead us to, to go back and revise um, our restrictive criteria to a more broader one. And that has um, been true for H3K positive tumors. So um, the updates to WHO take place, you know, anytime between five to 10 years. So, um, since the 2016 criteria uh, came out, uh, the neuropathologists and neuro-oncologists came up with this idea that they need to constantly update uh, the criteria, um, which led to, to formation of this consortium, uh, the C-IMPACT now, uh, which has constantly been releasing updates um, 
not official updates, but um, non-official updates to uh, the 2016 criteria. So um, the people who have um, been authors or um, editors of the WHO are essentially the same as, as this group. So, which means that they have um, kind of incorporated their own um, updates into the WHO criteria. So if you have been reading the C, uh, C impact updates, you would find that the, uh, that the new WHO would have essentially this, the same classification scheme. So going on, so now I would describe the, uh, briefly the changes that have um, occurred in the upcoming up WHO by tumor types. So first going into the diffuse um, adult type glioma. So previously in the 2016 criteria, we had uh, diffuse astrocytic and oligodendroglio clear tumors as one large group. And within that large group, there were, uh, they were divided by astrocytic and oligodendroglial. And then um, under that, there were the IDH mutants and the IDH wild types. So that was this essentially thought to be one large group. Uh, instead of that, in the upcoming WHO, we will have um, an adult type glioma and a pediatric type glioma. So the IDH mutant and the, and the IDH wild types would be grouped under uh, adult type gliomas. Um, and then um, um, we would separate out the IDH mutants from the IDH wild types. Um, the, uh, and then uh, there's also the pediatric type low-grade glioma and pediatric type high-grade glioma as separate groups. And that's because we now think that those three groups have very different biologies. Um, the uh, tumors classified as others in the 2016 remains largely the, the same, which includes the pilocytic PXA, um, astroblastoma and so on. So there's very little change that have, will um, occur in, in these entities, uh, except that if for a few entities, their um, molecular um, um, features will now be included in their nomenclature. So um, IDH mutant and IDH wild type um, diffuse gliomas are very different from each other. That's, um, as you can see in this um, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, curve. So that means that we should not call them by, this, by the same names. Um, so IDH mutant is one separate group and IDH wild type is one separate group. So uh, as um, in the 2016, both of them were in this same group, they were classified um, by this by the same grading scheme, uh, which is very different now. So there would be no um, IDH mutant uh, glioblastoma in the upcoming WHO. So we now know that uh, glioblastoma would be restricted only for IDH wild types. Um, for the IDH mutants, we would still um, grade them histologically from grade two to grade four, uh, but a grade four of IDH mutant behaves um, much more, um, uh, much less aggressively than the IDH wild type um, GBM. So we would not call it um, GBM. Um, and here you can see that, uh, that um, Previously, we would uh, classify the IDH mutant um, gliomas by histologic grading, um, by uh, presence of mitosis and so on. Uh, but over the years, we have found out that our um, 
histologic grading, unfortunately, is not very good. So if you take um, um, histologically graded grade twos and grade threes, they kind of behave the same way. So uh, that has led to a revision of histologic criteria. We can still um, uh, put them in, in grade twos and threes, but we know that that is not very good. So instead of, of that, we would now rely more on the molecular features in order to distinguish um, lower grades um, IDH mutants from the higher grade IDH mutants. So one um, important molecular feature that has, um, has um, come to light in the past few years is the CDKN2A um, gene. So a uh, homozygous deletion in this gene uh, would automatically place the IDH mutant glioma into a grade four. Um, so even if the histologic features are low grade, the presence of the CDKN2A or CDKN2B uh, gene would place it into a grade four category and it would, uh, is likely to behave aggressively. Uh, so that's essentially the change that would happen in the IDH mutant glioma. So firstly, no IDH mutant GBM. Um, it would only be called an ID, a, a grade four IDH um, astrocytoma. And then uh, the presence of a CDKN2A uh, or 2B deletion would place the tumor into a grade four. All right. So now coming to IDH wild type gliomas. Uh, so previously we required uh, necrosis, microvascular proliferation and increased mitosis as you, as you can see here for a tumor to, to call it a GBM or a grade four. But over the years we have found out that there are um, some tumors which look uh, low grade on histology, but still behave very aggressively. So this is one of our cases, um, a 46 year old male who presented with this brain lesion, uh, which looked uh, lower grade on radiology and then on histology, we, we uh, graded it as a grade two. But after like six um, or eight months, um, the tumor progressed very aggressively and very um, actively. And then at that time, uh, the biopsy showed a classic GBM feature, even on histology. So um, this was kind, kind of a loophole in the WHO 16 criteria that there were these um, low grade tumors, you know, which, which were actually molecularly higher grade. So over the years we have, found out that these, these uh, tumors, which look low grade, but, um, but um, um, act aggressively, feature uh, these three um, molecular alterations, either an EGFR uh, gene amplification, a loss of chromosome seven, or um, a gain of chromosome seven, or a loss of chromosome 10, or a mutation in the third promoter gene. So um, according to, to the upcoming classification, if the tumor looks low grade, but has any of these um, features, it would automatically be, be placed into an IDH uh, wild type GBM category. So essentially we're um, placing um, increasingly less um, emphasis on histology for some tumor types and more emphasis on their molecular features. So presence of any of these um, features, even in, the, in, in a low-grade tumor would uh, be sufficient to call it a GBM. All right, next coming to the second most common or the most common um, adult uh, tumor, which is meningioma. And um, 
for this tumor type, there would be two essential changes uh, in the WHO. One is that um, for um, higher grade meningiomas, such as a clear cell meningioma and a rhabdoid meningioma, we have uh, these molecular features that we can look for, and that would help us in making the diagnosis for those. And the second one is that um, similar to the GBMs, um, uh, we would um, we can have these molecular features which would automatically place um, meningiomas into a higher grade uh, category. And for meningiomas also, these, um, these um, um, features are loss of CDKN2A and um, mutation in the third gene promoter. So any of these would be sufficient to call it an anaplastic meningioma. So next coming to the pediatric type gliomas, um, we have uh, two separate groups within this category now. One is the diffuse low, low grade glioma and the other one is the diffuse high grade gliomas. Um, so within the diffuse low, low grade gliomas, um, um, the, mm, Describe here. So we have um, these will be classified by their um, fusion characteristics. So a presence of a MIB or a MIB L1 gene, gene fusion. Um, and you can also have these, it, it, these other gene uh, fusions or alterations. So this group uh, would be, uh, would be defined by their um, mutations in one of these uh, genes. And um, would, uh, the presence of these would automatically place into a WHO grade one uh, category. Uh, and these are not likely to like recur or progress into a, a, any higher grade uh, tumors. Um, there are, there is one new entity within this low grade group, which is the polymorphous low grade uh, neuroepithelial tumor of the young or plenty. Uh, I remember when I made this diagnosis for the first time, the, uh, the uh, neurologist was very impressed with my <laughs> uh, expertise. So these are low grade tumors. Um, um, usually associated with epilepsy, um, and uh, they uh, are marked by an oligodendroglial look and with a very strong CD34 staining. So that's essentially what these are. Uh, they, they also don't progress and, and are um, associated with long-term epilepsy. Um, so this is one of the, the new entities that we have recognized over the years. Um, now coming to um, high-grade gliomas in the pediatric population. So um, one major type, as, as you know, is the H3K27 altered or mutant tumors, which are mostly in the pons, but can be anywhere in the midline from the thalamus, basal ganglia, or spinal cord. So What's new in this entity is that uh, previously we required uh, the presence of, of a histone 3 lysine 27 mutation to call it this entity. But now um, we, uh, we will allow this diagnosis even in the absence of, of this mutation. Um, if the tumor has EGFR mutations or has a loss of, of um, methylation at that, at that site. So um, essentially we have broadened the, um, this um, group to include other um, biologically similar tumors which don't have the H3K27M mutation. 
Um, so um, either the tumor has this mutation, that's one group and that's, that's the majority of these tumors, uh, or it has an EGFR mutation and these tumors are mostly bilateral thalamic. Um, and the third group is um, tumors which don't have the H3K mutation and don't have EGFR, but they have loss of um, methylation in that site. Um, so those three groups would now be called an H3K 27M altered uh, category, and they uh, essentially behave the same as the H3K mutant tumors. Um, so now coming very briefly to the ependymal uh, tumors. So th um, this is the 2016 classification scheme, which uh, divided ependymal tumors into subependymoma, mixo papillary ependymoma, then ependymoma, ependymomas of different types. What's new in, uh, uh, in 21 is that we would first divide them into an anatomic um, site-based group. So there would be a supratentorial and infratentorial and spinal groups. And within those groups, we would have sub subgroups. Um, we would have a, a subependymoma a grade one in all, all three of them. And then um, uh, the supratentorial ones um, can be classified according to their molecular features, including um, REL A fusion and YAP1. And I would come back to, uh, to, uh, to um, REL A again. And then in the infra, the total group, we have the group A and group B. And, and in the um, spinal group, we have the uh, mix of papillary and then a new category, which is, is uh, defined by amplification of MIC-N. So uh, coming back to the supratentorial rel A fusion uh, based um, ependymoma, and as you know that uh, this is a higher grade or aggressive um, ependymoma. What's new in, in this group is that over the years, we have recognized that, um, that the fusion of REL-A with the C11 ORF uh, gene. Um, so in that, uh, in that grouping, the REL-A was not the important driver biologically, but it was the C11 a gene, which is now called the, um, the um, zinc finger transcription factor associated or, or um, ZFTA fused ependymoma. So um, the REL A group is now renamed uh, uh, ZF, uh, ZFTA um, um, ependymoma. Um, and then next coming to um, embryonal tumors, um, within the pineal tumors, um, uh, we now have these uh, different subtypes, which are essentially um, uh, be recognized only on methylation. And I think uh, Annie Huang uh, gave a very nice talk to your group about this. So I would not go uh, in, details on that. Within the medulloblastoma, the grouping res, uh, remains essentially the same with Wint's sonic hedgehog and non-Wint and, and non-sonic hedgehog groups with the, the change that there are, are, um, are um, subgroups within the sonic hedgehog and other groups, which can be recognized on methylation and which have slightly different prognosis and clinical features each. 
and uh, there are uh, we, we will also recognize the Fox R2 and B Core and uh, and other entities which are much much rare, but but now they have been officially recognized by the WHO. And finally, um, in the ATRT subgroups, we have uh, clinically and molecularly distinct groups, including tyrosine kinase, uh, sonic hedgehog, and MYC um, groups, which behave very differently clinically, uh, but can, all, can only be recognized on methylation. Uh, so uh, these uh, are the, uh, or this is the list of tumors that are essentially diagnosed only on um, methylation now. So um, while 90% um, of the tumors would be um, classified on NGS or um, histologic features alone, this is a list that, that would still require um, DNA methylation, which just recognizes the increasing need to have that uh, technique available. Um, so very briefly, uh, summary of what we discussed, there are um, regroupings of different tumors based upon their uh, improved understanding of their biological behavior. Uh, we have included some new um, entities and changed the names of some. Um, and um, I think essentially that's uh, what has happened in 2021. 20, I would uh, leave out the few limitations that I think are in this scheme. And then finally, um, most of these would be um, based on histology and like fish-based assays, which are available in most places, including AKU. Um, it does recognize, uh, or it, it does, uh, this um, classification would bring into uh, the question that the need for NGS-based uh, testing. Um, and um, finally, a few tumors in this uh, classification for the first time would require DNA methylation. So uh, that's all I have, and I would... Be happy to take any questions and um, and um, listen from you about your experiences. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilani, for an excellent talk. Really comprehensive, covering the whole topic. So I would like to ask Dr. Juma here. He's joined. He has joined us to for his comments and sir. So Dr. Gilani, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, the, uh, this information on the, on the new classification. And uh, um, I, I, there's two comments I would like to hear from you. One is that, um, do you see that uh, the, uh, this, this five year on, because 2016 to this five year on, uh, iteration of the classification is a significant advance because that was really uh, uh, that was really quite a, a major breakthrough um, but it, is, it a, is it a significant advance and in what direction that's number one and then I just want to ask a specific question about this. And does oh, boy, I'm sorry, Dr. Juma. Sorry, the, I the new Dr. Juma, pehle ek question suggests that the Dr. Juma, aapke awaz cut cut kar rahi hai. I see more often uh, than they are being now. Breast gliomas. I'm I'm sorry. So this second question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Wasn't able to hear. Let me just. I think so. I'm the first question he asked was. Can I Okay, let's go with first question. Okay, I'm, well, well, so first I'll one. come back in a second. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, so 
um, in terms of whether this is an is um, a major um, revision or a major and advancement as compared to 2016, I think the um, concept that uh, we would have a layered uh, diagnostic scheme with uh, histology and molecular features, I think that was a major uh, breakthrough in 2016. So in that sense, um, 2021 uh, 20, uh, is, is um, in a sense, con continuation of that. So I think it's not a major like a paradigm shift or anything. So I think it's more of a continuation and a sophistication of the 2016 paradigm. Sorry, Asil, can I ask my second question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, now we can hear you clearly. Please, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Rani, the second question relates to brainstem gliomas. And um, because there's a, a little more uh, detailed information about brainstem gliomas that we've gathered over the last 10 years or so, and does the new classification encourage biopsies of brainstem gliomas? Right, so whether the um, gliomas can be sufficiently uh, diagnosed based on radiology and clinical features alone. Uh, I mean, I'm a pathologist, so I, I want to like see tissue, uh, but um, I mean, on a more serious note, I think uh, the Question is whether there are some lower grade uh, tumors that would require a different treatment versus the other higher grade uh, tumors. So I think based upon the molecular features, whether there is an H3K or a histone three uh, pathway alteration versus an FGFR or a BRAF uh, uh, pathway alteration. So I think there is, is um, enough information or evidence now that those uh, two groups like behave very differently and, and should be treated differently. Um, um, and so my understanding is that the lower grade or the, the less aggressive tumors would require a, a, a different treatment than the higher grade ones. So, so that's, um, I think, one rationale for um, um, supporting that there sh should be histologic or tissue diagnosis before uh, treatment. And the second, um, I think, um, um, evidence or, or uh, support of this concept would be that um, for some alterations, we do have uh, targeted treatment um, so I think that uh, if you can identify a, a alteration that could be targeted by uh, by um, these newer agents, then um, then that can potentially change the management. Um, so I'm not sure if yeah, Dr. Noreen Mushtaq know, is I... here. Dr. Noreen Mushtaq is here. Dr. Noreen, what are your thoughts on that one? Because you know she ends up treating uh, a lot of these. Uh, Pediatric midland gliomas. So if 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 I can um, post the uh, yeah, I mean I don't know if Noreen Noreen is here in here or not. So Noreen would be able to lower grade versus higher grade. Do you treat them differently? And um, second question is whether uh, there is any role for um, targeted therapy in your practice. So, so target uh, therapy, yeah, Noreen, are we? Noreen is here. Yes. Dr. Noreen is no. here. Yeah, Noreen Bole. Hey, thank you, Dr. Rathar. So, um, uh, thank you, Emma. Such an excellent talk. So, um, mm -hmm. we do have, uh, we did have um, some of our pontine glioma biopsy and I think Hurram is not here, but uh, we had around nine or 10 uh, uh, high-grade uh, midline gliomas, like pontine biopsy and all of them 
um like out of 10 nine of them had high grade midline glioma h3k27 um and uh, uh, there is no treatment as far as the 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 group of h3k27 is concerned but then yes we do have we did have one patient with a pilocytic astrocytomyces still alive like uh, to answer Dr. Jima's question about the pontine glioma, Emma, this right, there is nothing in the classification as such. I think the 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 reason of biopsy depends on again the history, the radiological findings, and of course the exophytic component. Um, and then it depends what is it, or then the treatment depends on that. Um, at this point in time, um, we don't have the treatment of like the high grade midline gliomas available um, anywhere. People are working on it. But then, if we talk about the biothalamic tumor, the EGFR mutated tumor, we did have um, inhibitors here in Pakistan. So, you know, uh, it, it, these all things depend on. Um, on on the on the uh, history, physical exam, and all those things. If, if Next, I, uh, in my um, understanding was that the uh, I don't know what's the um, side effect or the, or the uh, the adverse prof, um, incidence in at your in, institution, but I I think most of the uh, midline gliomas in our institution are currently biopsied. Um, so what is like the mortality or morbidity rate at, at your place? Because it's very- so That's very interesting. You're saying that all the, all the midline gliomas, including the pontine gliomas are biopsied, all of them. Maybe. Okay. Uh, and so our practice is- yeah, our practice is uh, that you know only if there is uh, some kind of uh, a doubt about a diagnosis, that's when we go towards uh, a biopsy. Uh, so, but that uh, occurs after a discussion with the uh, oncologists, the pathologists, and I mean the tumor board. We discuss that and then we decide. Uh, Noreen, your thoughts about that? Would you ask for all the uh, pontine gliomas to be biopsied? I'm not talking about all the midline gliomas, all the pontine gliomas. A mute him, Noreen. So, um, thank you. So, um, uh, Dr. Athar, uh, not yeah. all uh, the gliomas. So, the uh, the typical of uh, the typical DIPGs, we don't usually um, ask for the biopsy. Um, the pontine gliomas, which seems to be like have a atypical behavior, atypical radiology or atypical behavior, we usually um, ask your help. So then we need a biopsy for those. And uh, that's the reason we have this amount of numbers. Uh, and to answer the question of Emma about the mortality and the morbidity, somehow they did pretty well. Like all of these children, as I've mentioned, the 10 or 11 or 9, which, we bio which, which are surgeons biopsied, I think none of them died because of any surgical complication. All of them died because of their disease progression. Um, and in fact, one child remained well uh, for three years. And she is the only one uh, in which we offered her uh, re-radiation. So um, uh, the h 3 k 27 positive, but the otherwise, the, all of them died because of the disease progression. None is with, with the surgical complications. Thank you. Okay. So I just have one announcement, Dr. Arthur, if you allow me, just that the participants are requested to please fill the evaluation form for a certificate of attendance. And we have given the link in the chat box. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I, I would reinforce that if we do that, because we want to find out if we are reaching out to everybody in Pakistan and outside Pakistan. Uh, so that would be great. Uh, I, I initially thought that we can have uh, uh, hands raised uh, of, uh, you know, asking different people if, uh, because there are a lot of uh, participants from outside Pakistan. I, 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 you know, uh, we have uh, people from uh, uh, Malaysia and uh, neurosurgeons and, and uh, other physicians from across. And then Dr. Nazir Qureshi is also has joined us today from, uh, from, uh, um, New Jersey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nazir Qureshi. Um, so, so, the, so if you can kindly fill that form, I'll get. We'll get an idea. Uh, kahan se hai. 
and uh, we should start to take all these questions. There are so many questions already. Yeah, we here. have, sir. So we, I, I can go through the questions, sir. You want yes, to have do that, do that, okay. they're so, waiting, right? Dr. Saira Fatma is asking, will surrogate immunohistochemistry markers be acceptable to classify as per WHO classification? Um, so for most tumors, it uh, they would be, uh, with the caveat that um, different um, surrogate IHC markers have different sensitivity and specificity. So for example, for L1 cam for the uh, REL-A or which would not now be called the CFTA, it's 70% um, or 80% sensitive. So you would still be like missing um, uh, some of them. Um, and um, I think for the um, wind and sonic hedgehog mesoblastomas also, you catch like 90% of them, but, but uh, leave out that, that small percentage. So I think increasingly um, since this, this would, this is also also for um, for lower um, resource places. Um, there would be some um, more um, markers coming out, but it would not be hundred percent sensitive. Right. Thank you. We have another question, sir. So it's kind of more like a general question. What is your experience or WHO recommendation on pediatric glioblastoma? So right. So. Uh, Pediatric glioblastoma. So, so now we know that adult and pediatric groups are very different. So there's hardly any IDH in 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 um, in, um, in um, young children or even in teens. Um, so we have the H3K uh, altered tumors, which we, which um, most of them would be automatically uh, grade fours, um, and then we would have uh, the uh, the um, Hemispheric um, H3G 34 RV gliomas. Uh, they can also be picked up pretty nicely by uh, the, um, uh, the G34 stain. And I think so, so H3K um, 27, H, H3G 34, those are two groups. And then the third large group would be the um, infantile or the childhood gliomas. And so they are, um, are defined by their um, uh, fusion status in ELK, um, ELK, NTRAC, uh, ROS, and um, uh, genes. So I think that's, uh, so those are three separate right. groups. I think out of those, the, um, the infantile and the congenital group is very interesting. So I, I um, ex um, hope to present a talk later in, in one of the um, research seminars, but, but that group um, has very good prognosis in our hands, like 70% um, um, of them or, or more have like survived for like more than 10, 15 years. So I think um, they would still be called uh, high grade gliomas or glioblastomas in, in, in this classification, but we know that they have very different prognosis. Okay. Right, thank you. So Dr. Altaf was raising hand. So Dr. Altaf, I would ask you to unmute yourself and please ask a question. Thank you. Thank you, Essen. Uh, uh, Dr. Nabil, excellent talk. So I was just wondering about the cost of these molecular testing. One of the main limiting factor in our part of the world is the cost. I mean, doing a simple MDMT methylation status for glioblastoma is humongous. So how do you see how to make these kits handy and cheaper in developing world? And what is the added cost you have in your part of the world? So um, I think we need to, to do like a more detailed analysis of how much it, it uh, are the costs involved, uh, you know, with uh, regards to like biopsy and you know the the uh, uh, the uh, 
surgical procedures and stuff. So, so that cost, uh, and then if you add the uh, radiology and the the um, oncology, like so, we're already like uh, spending that much money, you know, radiation and and all that on these cases. So, um, is there like a a good estimate of how much it costs for different types of tumors in Pakistan? You know. Um, if you take like every, all of these costs involved. So I think that number needs to be known. And then, then we can compare what would be the added cost of NGS-based or methylation-based uh, testing. So I think we need to know those two numbers and then see if um, we, would, um, we would gain anything in terms of uh, clinical prognosis or uh, quality of life if you do those added uh, right. testing. But in general, um, NGS, um, is, which is all, already available in AKU for uh, different other uh, diseases, I think adding a few of the um, neurology or, or neuro-oncology markers would not be that that much added cost. Um, in terms of, of like the uh, the absolute numbers, I think uh, a basic NGS um, uh, setup would be like 50, 50 to $80,000 to as a upfront cost and per case or per um, tumor, it would be around $500 or so. So for so, um, methylation, it would be about uh, 200 or 250,000 um, dollars upfront cost. And then for individual case, it'll be like $200. Um, so those are the absolute numbers, but I think we need to, to um, do a, a more thorough analysis of how much, uh, you know, we're already spending on these kids and if we will get any added right. benefit of, of adding right. molecular. Right. So, thank you. So because we have many questions, I just want to go through more questions because, you know, I think the audience wants to talk to you more. So I have another question here from Dr. Raf, Rafia Tour, and she is asking if the aggressiveness of the tumor biology will affect the radiation dose for treatment. So radiation oncologist, I think. is. A, so what are your thoughts, sir, Dr. Girani, if you would like to? Um, that's a little bit about my uh, pay right, grade. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah um, I can move to the next question, sir, because we okay, have plenty yeah. of them. So, so, of and, like giving the wrong information, I guess. All right, so perfect. So, and uh, so the next one is coming from Muhammad, and he's, he's asking if. So, yes, so if, if, we, if we have time, we can always take that, come back to that question. I'm sure there right. are senior colleges over here. Right. But let's first uh, use Ahmed Gilani as much as we can today. Right. So here, is, I think Dr. Muhammad is asking, I'm wondering how about uh, about how this new classification can serve or modify the concept of a neurosurgeon toward approaches or decision making. So Dr. Atha, you would like to say something well, or Dr. Ahmed Gilani? So Ahmed Gilani asked that question already, right? And uh, Dr. Juma answered that and we sort of answered that question. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Altaf also made a uh, you know a, a very important point about the cost and all that thing. So yes, we would like to have all the information available so that we can, uh, you know, uh, make informed decision. But then, uh, you know, as as we discussed about the predictive versus prognostic value, right? So, uh, so, so those which have predictive value, we should take care of those first uh, because our therapy will depend on that. But if it's just a prognostic value, then I think it's a waste of money. Because even if you send for NGS to places like Macrogen, so so in talking about NGS, we need to have a good volume before we do that. And that will be a problem. Right. Uh, having a machine on D is not enough. Uh, we don't have that volume. And if you send it out to like Macrogen and other places, that's about $600. The total expense of brain tumor uh, surgery and treatment on average comes to about uh, what? Maybe three or $4,000 in AKU. Mm -hmm. You go to some public sector, then obviously it's less than a thousand dollars, you know. So these things then add up uh, a lot of expense. 
uh, so we have to restrict ourselves uh, to the predictive ones only. Right. So. Well, one thing that I would like to add here is, is that there, there are some newer uh, sequencing te technologies would, which would be in the order of uh, less than $100 per, per case and which don't need to be like uh, bashed in, in, in large, um, large volumes. So I think uh, Nanopore is one of them. And I think um, last week we, uh, when um, Stefan Feister was talking, I, th I think he, he also mentioned that as, as an upcoming uh, technology. So I think if, if, if we have the, for, for a place like AKU, you know, uh, it probably makes sense to have at least like a research setup, you know, which, which is able to do some of the, this um, sequencing and potentially also have like a research program that, uh, that um, looks at like developing these um, newer technologies for developing world. Right. We have another question from Dr. Noor Aizan and asking like for ETMR, C19 MC entity, is there any targeted therapy for this tumor? And is it mandatory to do C19 MC molecular study in this case? So, so I think, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a high grade tumor and kind of behaves like an, an ATRT or, uh, uh, or uh, um, worse acting medulloblastoma. So as far as I know, uh, the treatment and prognosis is, is not very different from other embryonal tumors. Um, and um, we do uh, an uh, um, LIN28 uh, immunostain, which is pretty sensitive. So I think it can be diagnosed okay. based on regular methods. Dr. Atar, you do you have a question, sir? Yes, I was going to ask, but then there's uh, someone, uh, Mahams. Mahams. Mahams yeah, let's ask that question. Uh, okay, but so I, I, so, so I, mean, I want to ask you that question about the IDH mutation. Uh, we talk about IDH mutation; it's a glamogenetic thing. So it's a you know it's it's a uh, it's it doesn't make sense that uh, for glyomogenesis, the IDH is mutated and alpha ketoglutarate is is uh, has that effect. But then the wild type is actually has a worse prognosis. So uh, so you know that I haven't been able to answer that. I thought that maybe someone MD PhD like you. Would have the answer to that question so but then go ahead with with maham maham right. Yes. 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 right so maham zahar is asking when the tumors recur they may progress to a higher grade than already classified how will the new classification apply on the recurred tumors and will the treatment depend on the new classification found or the previous classification used for the original tumor diagnosis so I mean, uh, the the second question first, whether um, we would update the diagnosis for different tumors. I think we should if uh, treatment depends upon that. Um, and coming back to the first one, um, um, if, if you have already like treated this uh, tumor with some sort of um, modality, whichever it is, then the behavior of the tumor would be different. So the um, natural, um, natural history of the tumor has already been altered. So I would not like grade it uh, once it has been treated. Okay, thank you. Sir, Dr. Atha, now you can ask the question. No, sir, I have asked the question already. So, okay, so I, Dr. Plan, no. you can answer the question. Yes. So. Oh, by the way, sorry. So, 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 uh, uh, Dr. Qureshi, do you want to uh, turn on and just uh, uh, show your good-looking face from North America? Uh, oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, Nazir Qureshi is here. So we were just talking, and uh, and, and Dr. Nazir Qureshi is a neurosurgeon in, in 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 Pittsburgh. We we chatted yesterday, and he said he will join this. So, Dr. Nazir Qureshi made a point. Here. I yeah. think so. He's muted. Thanks for yeah, Nazir, you're muted. Yes. Okay, no. uh, so uh, yeah, you, okay, you now. Yeah, okay. You made a point okay. about the biopsy of the pontine glioma. And, you know, yeah, so it's, over there is also the same, it's right? Excellent, it's an excellent talk, Dr. Jelani. Um, uh, it sounds like everything's been turned upside down. So, 
uh, as uh, Dr. Inam's question about GBM, it sounds like the GBM we know is only the wild type now. So the other one shouldn't even be called GBM. And I've had mm -hmm. cases who uh, some of them survive for six years, eight years. And obviously they're, you know, depending on the MGMT um, and methylation and then IDH wild type and so on and so forth. So now really just calling a GBM, a GBM doesn't really make sense. Uh, and similarly, for all these tumors that you have described, you need a biopsy, and we've always had this issue with the pathology because they always, you always need a tissue. Uh, taking a tissue from a palms in a child, I don't think anybody would go there. So uh, I don't know how this classification is going to change the management of all these tumors. So... If I understand correctly, you agree with the uh, the IDH mutant not not being called a GBM, right? Correct. That's exactly yeah. what I'm okay. saying. That the so, mutant type shouldn't even be called GBM because when you say GBM, it means it's some it's some improvement that they've done in this classification. Then. Right. <laughs> so I I think the one thing that they should have done is and I say, well, let's take it out of from the category of GBM and call it something else. Right. Because when you say GBM, it means it's bad prognosis. Right. So, so what's the answer, uh, Ahmed, uh, on that question about the, about the alpha ketoglutarate and IDH mutation and, and um, the mild, mild type actually bet, a, wor a better prognosis, a worse prognosis than the mutant? So, I mean, uh, one, one thing that I, 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 I think is true is that there is, um, there are more like background mutations that, that happen in wild type gliomas. Um, as opposed to IDH mutant. So I'm not exactly sure if that explains the better behavior. Uh, but in terms of like actual, um, uh, um, you know, answer to that question, I, I don't have a- but that means, So, so the, mutation, the mutation does occur early on during the biomedicine, right? Yeah. In right. all of them. So, so yeah, so I, I just haven't been able to put it together. Uh, right. Why the wild you, type better? And it, if I understand correctly, like it changes the um, epigenome somehow. So like different sets of genes are turned right. off, on and off as compared to the wild types. So so correct? yeah. So alpha ketoglutarate, you know, affects the methylation status of the promoters, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So wild type, but the wild type will will have the same promoter. Uh, 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 this effect that uh, uh, that a normal cell has, whereas the mutant one will not be able to do that. So that may put the cell on a non-apoptotic pathway, right? So I I, I don't know I'll how. Noreen has Noreen has Noreen has a, Noreen yes, has yes, a, Noreen, 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 has Noreen a hand is raised. Noreen has an answer. Noreen, but I am. <laughs> I have a question actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead with the question. So, so, so uh, Ahmed, uh, can you comment on um, the CMMRD associated hybrid glioma? Is there anything in this newer classification regarding the constitutional mismatch repair um, uh, I, associated um... hybrid? I haven't had a chance to look through the, uh, through the uh, chapter on like the tumor syndromes. Um, and so I don't exactly know whether they have included anything new in, in that or not. Uh, but like, see, uh, uh, I mean, that syndrome is essentially not like seen in the US like very, very rarely. So I think it's less of a problem here. So there might not be, a, be you know, their focus here, you know, so so yeah, I think uh, their 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 um, treatment is increasingly thought to be different, right? With the PDL one inhibitors and stuff, um, is that correct? You're mute, Noreen. Cynthia Hawkins was talking about that too. Noreen, you're mute. Amit is asking you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so. So, so uh, yes, the, the treatment is totally different. Emma. It's it's uh, the uh, Im, uh, immune point check inhibitors, right. um, which people are using for the uh, CMMRD. And it's 
not usually um, you know give response to the uh, conventional timozolamide or avastin or you know irinotecan so people are moving towards that time the problem the you are right that it's not that common in in the us because uh, you know consanguinity is not there so it's yeah, our problem yeah. basically so uh, we do have like like i've seen many patient many families with this cmmrd syndromes and somehow they are the ones who you know uh, you know we we were just unable to treat them like whatever you did is like nothing um, happened so we are just in the process of having some kind of clinical trials um mm. with this immune point check inhibitor at some point in time maybe a kaat saal mein we will start something like that with the sickets team um as a co you know co host of that study so i hope it will start so abhi us pe kaam ho raha hai so i hope ke hum us pe kuch next time kabhi aapko de sake kuch you know kuch isn't that's very impressive so, so i think uh, the um, nanopore and like some of 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 these like neural methods i i think we should look yeah. at um, diagnostic role of of like those uh, technologies in uh, in um, ccmrd uh, germline yeah. testing and stuff like that so i will contact you about that i think it's a yeah. project that we we can do yeah. so um we just started emma um i think okay no the, 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 this is our advertisement uh, okay. don't worry <laughs> marin <laughs> i i'm just telling emma that um in in pediatric high grade high grade glioma we have started doing uh, these immunohistochemistry of the cmmrd uh, the pms2 the msh1 uh, mlh6 and those markers so you know we uh, so we make it mandatory for our pediatric patients to have these markers in all those high grade glioma from 0 to 18 years of age so this all is we have start for them now all oh yes all pediatric high grade gliomas okay Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. So I think it's we are getting to time. I know it's uh, Rafi, Rafi, there's Dr. Rafi Atur. She has a question. We can use that as the last question. Uh, well, so before before we do that, can I remind everybody to please fill up that form? Uh, you know, for your to get the certificates. It's just a, a few, just few questions, and it also helps us understand whether we're reaching out. And and you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm so uh, honored. Not I'm. I mean, all of us are honored to have uh, participants from outside the country. From from Malaysia, we have Dr. Chen, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Uh, uh, so yeah. So Dr. Chen is from uh, Malaysia here, and uh, um, Dr. Uh, Revati. Uh, Dr. Uh, Athar Revati is also here. Revati is also from yeah. Malaysia. She's a pediatric oncologist. Right. 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 um so so yeah quite quite a few people from different part of yeah. the world thanks very much uh, for attending everyone <laughs> okay so, so dr rafi does not have a question she was just making a comment here i oh, think okay. so yeah there's like she wants like radiologist and the pathologist you know should attend and like then more like then, a why don't you then why don't you advertise your symposium asan and the brain so yes yeah, so here we have the flyer of our symposium that we are going to have the annual your oncology symposium from september 3rd to 5th and we will also have pre symposium hands on workshop so all the uh, neurosurgery trainees or young neurosurgeons are welcome to for this workshop and all of you are welcome to attend please register and i think we will have we we are hoping looking forward to a great symposium okay All right, sir. So it's time. If you want to uh, add something, Doctor Ather, Doctor Gilani, uh, not me, Doctor Gilani, Doctor Juma, you know, any, any, any of our uh, audience from outside the country, if they want to add some comment, uh, please feel free to do so. The whole idea of uh, this uh, this kind of webinar is uh, uh, that uh, we, uh, I mean, it's really sort of semi-formal. So you know, say anything and discuss anything. Uh, that's the idea. we don't want to keep it formal so thank you very much for joining though okay all right so uh, thank you thank you all thank you so much so if no questions no comments so hope to see you all soon after two weeks take care enjoy your weekend okay. thank, thank you, you. Dr. thank Lani. you very thank much, you so much. I... thank you so much 
I wanted to thank uh, yes. thank everyone for joining in on this uh, Saturday um, afternoon. And I always like learn a lot from clinicians. So the it's been a pleasure. You know, neurosurgeons already have that. neurosurgeons already have big heads, so you don't want to say anything more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Noreen has been Noreen has been dealing with us, and you know she tries to keep our head size under control, right, Noreen? I say to everyone that if our neurosurgeons are good, this is not possible. It's not possible in our part of the world. Please, it's please. all because of you, Doctor Atar, because of your yes, team. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Th